All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. This this will do farm edition. We're going to talk today a, a little bit about our farming operation, and uh, we get a lot of questions about that. So we thought it's a little pre pre harvest. So there are there are damn few four hundred acre grain farmers out there, and the reason that we're able to operate is with us today because uh, not many people have the quality of equipment or the quality of technology that we have available when it comes to planting and harvesting. And the reason for that is the, the guy that's here, he is the, uh, he is the, the innovator. He's the innovator. Sometimes he's the devastator and he is the master mechanic at tall corn acres. But before we get to him, we got to pay the fee, guys. So you guys know the drill. If you get any value from the show, share it out with your friends, family, coworkers, employees, whoever. We're trying to grow this thing. Uh, we don't run ads to promote the show. We don't run ads on the show. It's all organic. It's kind of a ticket to admission to watch or listen to the show. Also, leave a review on Spotify or Apple. Um, that helps us out a, a lot as well. Um, we see everybody that's been doing that. We really appreciate everybody that pays the fee. Um, and then last thing I got to say is if you guys have any questions that you want us to answer on our Q&A episodes, submit them at barntalkshow at gmail.com. I'm not going to do polls on Instagram anymore because some people miss them. Some people don't don't see it. So Barn some Talk Show aren't on Instagram. Yeah, some people aren't on Instagram. So Barn Talk Show at gmail.com if you want to submit questions to us to answer on our QA episodes. Also, if you want to send us feedback in any way, that's a good place to send it as well. So reach out reach out to us there. And without further ado, let's get into the show. Hey, one more thing while I think about it, and I'll try to put this at the end too, because we we had a lot of a lot of people that really like bourbon talk, and I'll try to remember to mention this in the end. We are going to get back to bourbon talk next next week. Uh, next week episode will just be us, and we'll do a little bourbon talk. And the other thing I want to throw out is, in two weeks, I think we're going to have uh, Claire Dunn on the podcast. Um, she's a country music artist that reached out to us, and um that ought to be that's something totally different than what we usually do but ought to be damn interesting so uh check her out on social media her name's claire dunn uh super nice lady and she's going to be here in two weeks so let's get started welcome david zeezer how's it going it's not too bad how are uh how are fall preparations coming they're coming along uh slow but sure um all the stuff on the combine that was broke last year for some reason didn't fix itself while I was sitting in the machine shed. So it's because you didn't water it. It hasn't rained. Yeah. I've noticed that if I'd have left all my shit outside, it'd be perfectly clean going into I don't know, only because we got that one we got one good over one inch rain. Well, Other than that, true. everything's been dirty as hell all summer. Yeah. But no, sitting in the shed, man, it just gets covered and junk and full of mice, so yeah, I haven't found any chewed wires this year, so that's a good thing. But oh, I fixed my header speed control. I eh, fixed. Um, supposedly, the big valve body on the side is most likely cracked, and that's why it doesn't hold. Speed. Oh yeah, that's right. So that thing is just the ba- valve body is three large. So I'm gonna set it manually, and then I put a little ball valve up on the head. So I'm gonna set my hydraulic pressure, and then go down and shut that ball valve. <laughs> Well, that should work. I hope it works. Yeah. But that was kind of the big thing that I, I got into this year. And then my my header control on the uh, oh the platform wasn't working last year. Yep. So I drug the wiring all the way out through the column on it and patched a spot where the mice had chewed. And it appeared to be working the other day when I tested it. So, But otherwise, uh, changed the oil in the 4640 and... Yeah, we're pretty much ready to go. I just got to get wagons out, air up tires, get the bins opened up, and I think we, we're ready. We haven't even started. We haven't 
greased anything. We haven't, haven't cleaned out the auger. Do you guys want to buy a combine? No. Someday, I just don't think well, I got a, we yeah, will. I got a combine. I would, I would buy your. He I'll doesn't, buy your combine. but I do. The only stipulation is, and I'll overpay for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you just have to come with it. That's the only. That's the only kicker. Because See, that, I, we're looking. We're going to do a little extra manure this fall. So I was thinking, well, maybe if I get somebody to combine and deal with the combine, then I can just be ready to haul shit when it's time to haul shit. There you go. That might be the thing. Why don't you give them a little background for what David does for us? Yeah, so any of you that are crossovers from the This Will Do Farm channel, um, we we don't plant our own crop, and we don't harvest our own crop, and we don't apply our own manure. So you'd say, God, you guys are lazy <laughs> bastards. Don't do shit. We, we are kind of lazy bastards whenever we get the chance, but... Um, I grew up in a in a Massey family, so we we ran the entire Massey Ferguson line up to the 850, and um, so it's kind of like when you just have consistently bad experiences with equipment, you get to the point where you know I don't I don't know if I necessarily want to own a combine, and with no more than what we farm, um, it just doesn't seem to make sense. As much as David would like for me to buy his combine, it doesn't seem to make sense for us to own one. And what I like about uh, our our partnership is that if you don't already know it, you're going to find out that uh, David might have received some of this from his father, but he's very mechanically inclined, and he's also very adaptive. And so uh, he, likes, he likes technology, and he likes... Uh, he likes equipment um, that he can work on, and thus it keeps working even when we get sidetracked. It doesn't stay sidetracked very long. And so it's been awesome for us because we, we basically um, get the ground ready in the spring, and now then that we basically no-till, we've kissed that off. We, we, don't, we don't even do a good job of that. And then uh, we haul a lot of corn in the fall, and... Uh, stand around and watch we we're there for moral support so if any of you saw like when uh the rotor was slugged uh in the combine <laughs> we're always there to uh, uh hand wrench cheer them on <laughs> and go boy that looks oh that's fucked up that was much appreciated <laughs> yep yep uh those, those little things help other than that we're pretty much useless but david is he is the he's the secret behind our our farming operation he is and don't get it twisted I would like to eventually someday plant our own acres and get our own combine. Dad, maybe not, but I do definitely. But we just got to grow the farm a little bit because it just doesn't make sense. Yes, you grew up on massy equipment, but that really isn't the biggest reason. It's not. It's not. It's that we got to get more acres to farm to for it to make sense, truly. So, or just as much as I like David, you know, I like having him come every fall and every spring, but, you know, sometime. Maybe we can kick you to the curb. Well, it, it, <laughs> so send your donation today. Yeah. If you would, so we're just starting the new the new Whistler Equipment Fund. Uh, just feel free to join at whatever GoFundMe page we're going to start, and just uh, yep, send it our way. Well, it it helps and it hurts me both. So I really we need the income. It helps me take care of the equipment, but at the same time, it's a little extra wear and yep. tear on the equipment. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I mean our combine is probably towards the end of its natural yep. life so things are starting to fall apart how yeah. long have you had it we've had it so <clears throat> since you burnt the last one down yeah mom and dad before i started farming uh, i know 10 had the wonderful combine fire which was kind of a big deal for a major equipment manufacturing company at the time they were kind of shitting bricks for a while but uh we ended up our combine is an 010 so we got an 010 and it was brand new yep insurance paid part of it and then we paid off the rest but it's it's no 10 and i think it's got 18 or 1900 hours on it um it's in the prime of its life stuff stuff starts breaking and you go to the dealer and they're like well that's yeah it's that's how it goes that time that it's yep. going to start breaking and you're like what's well, only got 900 separator hours on it yep but, yeah it's or a thousand separators whatever it's such a vicious circle. And I mean, I, I think the only thing I can equate it to for like people that aren't in ag would be 
I'm assuming it'd be similar for guys that are in the in the dirt work business in the yeah. fact that this equipment has gotten so high priced that to justify owning it, you have to run just a shitload of acres through it. The problem is you run a shitload of acres through it, just and then you, it and then you wear it out. Yeah. So I don't really know. I don't really know what the answer is um, because you either have to buy used equipment and fix somebody else's problems or buy new and just trade all the time and just pay, just have that fixed cost of it's going to cost me this yeah. much an acre for equipment. And some people argue that it's it's about the same whichever way you go because the the repairs can be as great as the as the payment on the new one but yeah i mean by the time we've got we've got quite a few other debts right now that we need to get knocked down before we can get a new combine but yeah by the time our combine's ready for yep trade yep it's probably not going to go to china more, much more than parts yeah so give us a little bit of the background of just you personally, business, farm, all that. How'd you, how'd you end up back on the farm? Give us a little bit of that. All right. Well, I'll start with where the farm came from. So, uh, Grandpa Fred Rada bought the farm in 1913, um, and he farmed with his uh, two boys, um, Jesse and Don. Don being my grandfather, and then they had two other sisters as well. Um, Uncle Jesse fought two world wars and Don stayed home to work the farm. Um, well, long story short, Don ended up dying in 1967. Um, so my grandmother basically rented the farm to the neighbors until 1980. Um, when my father and mother who were living and working in Cedar Rapids at the time, Rockwell Goss and, um, Kirkwood, Decided that farming was the life for me, so they brought us down. Um, I was one at the time and got into it then, and, yeah, the 80s were a struggle. Yeah, that <laughs> that must have struggle. been a powerful, because to make that decision would be tough, but to make that decision in 1980, I was sitting here thinking, going, they must have really wanted to farm. Yeah, naivete. Yeah, that helps. Was a lot of it. Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, pigs have always sustained us, um, through the eighties yep. and nineties, dad and mom were farrowing and, um, row cropping, um, renting, you know, family land basically is what it, what it boiled down to. Um, and then in, uh, so then, yeah, I mean, I grew up on the farm helping, cut teeth and tails and castrate and move pigs and bed pigs and all that stuff. We, one of the craziest things we did is we loaded pigs on a day where it was sleeting and storming and the old trailer hitch trailer or bumper hitch trailer. And we head to Kelowna and highway one is just a sheet of ice. So we get to the part where it goes down into the, yep. To the English River Valley, and luckily the sand truck had just gone through, so we low gear and slowly creeped, creeped her down creeped there, creeped her down that hill. But yeah, we did a lot of crazy things. But um, yeah, I guess high school, I was into 4-H, FFA, band, football, all that stuff. I uh, graduated in 1998 and decided that the farm wasn't the place for me at the time. I always loved farming and wanted to to be a farmer. Um, but dad and mom were, you know, just finally getting their feet under them financially. So I went to Iowa state, uh, studied engineering for two years. And after one full calendar year of physics, yep, where I went from an F to a D to a Ooh, C. Wow. Same course. Yep. I decided, I don't think, uh, engineering is is cut out for me. Plus I couldn't understand half of the professors what they were saying or what they even wanted me to do. Right. So I found industrial technology, which is kind of engineering light and was in the education department, but it was basically shop class for college kids. Yep. So we had like woodworking class and uh, foundry. We did, we made little Iowa state um, coasters and that kind of stuff. But anyway, graduated college 
with the BS in a, a short six years. Some people have MS and doctors in that amount of time, but I got out with just a bunch of BS and uh, worked for a plumbing contractor as a project coordinator in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Not a project coordinator, a project estimator in Cedar Rapids. Did that for four years. Um, and then in 08, a friend of mine from college, good friend, worked for H&I, which is Han or All Steel and Muscatine, and said, hey, we're hiring engineers. You need to put your resume in. So I did, and that went well from 08 to 2012. Um, a lot of lean manufacturing stuff. Yep. Um quality, uh, control, um, you know, just product flow, those types of things. And then in, uh, 2012, dad and mom were kind of ready to start backing off a little bit. Um, they had always done it all themselves. Like mom would run the combine all the time. She would run the soil finisher and chisel plows and all that stuff. Um, but they were ready to to transition and to move me back in. So they built their, our fourth hog barn, a 1200 that year. And then I was going to come back and chore it and do all of that stuff. Um, I'll back up here a little bit in 98. So 98, as I'm leaving to go to college, they broke ground on the first thousand head pig barn. So they built that one in 98. They built our second thousand in 2002. They built our third barn, which is a 2400 in 2007. And then, yeah, the final straw, what we got now is yeah. this 1200. So we've got 5,600 pig spaces. But anyway, back to 2012, I came back. I did the chores on the barn um, and was just kind of farmhand helping at the time. Mom was still doing all the book work and stuff like that, and Dad was kind of the operations um, chief. Um, what goes where and the decision on the seed and all that stuff. Mom got sick with cancer in 2015, and she ended up passing away in 2016. So that shifted things around again quite yep. a bit. So then um, I kind of became the decision maker of – what goes where and that kind of stuff. And then dad is now um, still into the um, money decision and the writing the bills and all. I thought stuff. you were going to say, I thought he was, <laughs> I thought he was into. And he's our, he's our head mechanic. Yes, and exactly. Number one groundskeeper. Yeah, project manager. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but he's doing all that now. Um, and then my wife and I moved finally to the farm in 2018. I got, and I quit chore and then too. Um, it just got to be too much. Me living in Riverside, driving yep. an hour a day, um, driving down in the middle of the night for to alarm calls, load pigs or the yeah, whatever. alarm that shall not be mentioned. Yep. That would always call with a false alarm. <laughs> um, and I just wasn't there, you know, to be with the kids. I'd get home late or, yep. and I couldn't get enough done on the farm. So, um, Gave the chore duties over to Eichelbergers, and um, yeah, now I just look walk around all day looking for shit to do. Yep, yep. So, um, <laughs> one thing, and we'll we'll probably touch on this later, but you know, so your your interest in engineering and um, just that kind of stuff that probably didn't come from happenstance, knowing your father. Because uh, right. to go back to the to the 80s, my first memory of your dad is because uh, our old hog buildings, when we were Pharaoh to finish, we had a ritual uh, where every every weekend or every sometime when we would sell pigs, we had an extra set of divider gates that went so our finisher we had a 500 head finisher that had 16 pens in it and um actually had 32 pens because the alley was down the middle and they had the gates that ran from the alley to the wall and then all the alley gates and we had a full set of gates that ran from the alley to the wall and two alley gates extras and the reason we did is because we built these parts in the 70s and they were all rusted out so Wayne Zeezer 
coming. He was a damn good welder, is a damn good welder. Yeah. And somehow my dad, my dad latched on to Wayne and he was the, he was the savior because we would tear out a full divider gates that had been welded on 15 times from the welding shop in Washington. I might be exaggerating a little, but they'd been welded (laughs) on quite a bit, load them up, take them over to Zeezers, and then we'd come home and put our spare set in. And then when the next time that one was shot, you went in and they had it loose from the wall and they were moving it back and forth. Oh, time to call Wayne and see if he had those done. And yeah, yeah. Dad ran a welding shop through all the eighties and into the nineties. Um, so that was another pretty good source of income. Um, to be honest, Torque, those nasty shitty hog gates are why he's like, I'm fucking tired of this. People just bringing me the shit. <laughs> yes. I'm quitting. Yep. But yep. no, he, he really enjoyed the, <laughs> he enjoyed the work and the, the customers, but yeah, I watched him and he, he took an old four row, uh, cultivator side mount that went on our 656 he took that thing and he converted it into a six row yep and then he built a um front three-point mount for our 1086 so then we had a front mount six row cultivator yep which if you've ever cultivated corn yep (laughs) that's when you wipe out corn as you look back to make sure you're not wiping out corn yep and then you start wiping out corn yep so he did that um i watched him make a uh okay so then we go from a six row planter to a 12 row planter well we don't have a field cultivator so we bought an old eight row wide glencoe converted that into a 12 row 30 inch field cultivator field cultivator yep we needed a rotary hoe uh so he i don't know if he bought the tines i think he got them from the deer store for basically nothing but he built everything all everything on a 12 yep. row field coal or uh rotary yep. hoe um so yeah i just i watched him do that my whole life he's pretty good at woodworking um yeah he, he can fix damn near just yep. about anything yep so yeah i mean i i watched that and kind of became somewhat mechanically inclined um and yeah that's got me into wanting to you know kind of be involved in the manufacturing process i i don't know if i would have liked design engineering at all or not yeah because they were just in their office all the time yep right um but i liked what i did with engineering i was going from the design reading the prints to the floor um so that got me out to visit with the people and kind of hang out but um So when you decide, when you made the decision, when that started looking like you were going to come back, you were married at that point. I was, yeah. What, so what, so is your, does your wife come from a f- ag background or city girl or? Good question. So my, um, I met my wife's brother at college. We were in the same fraternity together. And um, after college, you know, I moved back to Iowa City, was living there, and their family was from Tiffin, and they farm as well. Um, so they were into ag, and then we just kind of met up one New Year's Eve. and You thing, gave her the kiss. kiss. One thing led to it. <laughs> yeah. You thought that it would be a she, cruel joke on your best friend to uh, date be, his she sister? Was, she was a little more into me than I was. Oh, okay. All right. The well, then it's all right. But... Uh, so she was on board with the idea of, of coming back to the farm. Um, uh, still up in the air? She liked the money of the engineering job. The yes. hours weren't great, great, because, you know, you'd, you'd go to work on a Friday and you'd tell your wife, all right, it should be done by 2 or 3, because I put in yeah. four tens and a couple 12s already this week. But um, something would go wrong, and... Yep. She'd call, when are you coming home? Well, I don't know. Got to get this up and running. This happened, and all the big chiefs are here stomping and yep. chomping and wanting this fixed. But, um, yeah, she kind of knew what she was getting into, and, yeah, we've we've had some struggles here and there. But Everybody does. Thank God she's with me because she's a pretty good woman. So. Yeah, she's still holding on hope that she can fix you. 
That's the thing. You just you want to you just want to so. keep dangling that carrot out there. Did he give up eventually? Well, I think that's when things. <laughs> I think that's when things really when the wheels fall off. If they ever decide that there isn't any hope left to try to fix you, I think that's when you're like, ooh, I I fucked up. This is this is year ten. So is, are we are we to that point now? Probably no, no. If she's anything like, I mean, I'm. <laughs> What am I? Tw- uh, 29? You're 29? No, yeah, I'm 29. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, we were married in 93. So, yeah, at 23, we will be will be our 30th anniversary. And Trisha still, like... Still thinks she can fix she, you. Well, there are some things that she just doesn't... We don't have those fights anymore because she's just resigned herself that I'm ignorant and I'm not ever going to get that figured out but there's still i think the list was long enough that she's working her way down and i i think i got a good you know i think i got at least that much left before all the options are exhausted so 10 years i think you're fine 10 years okay yeah i think you're fine made it this far i think we can make it another. yeah i think he's gonna figure just it out. throw a few you know what honey you were right just throw one of them in every once in a while yeah and, that really helps the hope I've noticed, meter. I've noticed those do help, yeah. Mm-hmm. They and, like you, and you redid the house. That's got to give you some round yes. points. Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> the year we were moving to the farm, it was, uh, boy, I'd really like to have a nice shop to work on stuff. Mm-hmm. So, Dad, another, here's your here's your make anything out of nothing guy. He took our old barn and yep. put a shop in it, and we've been surviving on that. It's like 17 wide by 30 deep so none of our equipment now fits, <laughs> fits in the in fucking it. thing but um but yeah i was looking at pricing on building a shop and mama said well it would make more sense if we lived on the farm you could spend more time with us and logistically it would be better and she said but uh the basement's not in very good shape and i think we should fix it up mm-hmm so mama got a new house and yep <laughs> i got a good tan and a good yep well digger's ass in the middle of winter yep. <laughs> that's right you did a great job on it looks great <laughs> working on the equipment outside in front of the old barn yeah uh, so what do you think the biggest challenge for ag is today uh we're kind of in a weird we're kind of in a weird time in ag weird year it's it's expensive it's hard to get nitrogen it was hard to get nitrogen oh it's gonna Inputs be hard are to get expensive. nitrogen again next year's yeah. gonna be hard yeah. What do you think? What do you think the biggest challenge is? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be all financial, um, and I think the biggest problem is the policies and the policymakers. Yep. Unfortunately, everything is political. Um, we look at our corn and bean prices, and they don't always make sense. The swings they take. Why do they go up on Friday, and why do they go down on Monday? Um, USDA admitted in 2020 that they missed the final readout on crop by pretty maybe, maybe 50%. Yep. Well, what did that do to our, and they were high. Yep. Is what they admitted. Well, what did that do to our prices mm-hmm. all through the fall? Yep. Um, and then there's such a push environmentally. Which, don't get me wrong, I mean, and we can talk about this later. This is kind of what I think where ag is going, and I'm excited for some of these environmental things, but um, the people that live in cities and make these policies think that we can grow enough food on less inputs, and that's just not going to happen. But to go with the reason the fertilizer prices went up, I mean, we always joke, well, because they can, or it's yep. because cost of our commodities are what, you know, our corn and soybeans and wheat and all that are going up. But I do think it is in effort to try to save the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I mean, we can, I've heard some theories that, I mean, they may even be looking at population control. I'm not going to go that far yet, yeah. but... Um, I just think there's, there's people that don't understand what it takes to grow food. I was listening to a strip till podcast 
and they had a guy on. I think he was from a college in Massachusetts somewhere. He was pretty logical about it. He said, you know, I, I love all these, you know, northeastern food stands. Farm to table, you drive up to the countryside, and you can get fresh vegetables whatever. and whatever you want. But he's like, to be honest, when you look at what modern agriculture has become, you know, one person is farming more ground now than Ever. 50 people were 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he's like, there just really is no more efficient way to produce food than what we have right now. And then he closed the loop and he said, you drive up to those farm to table stands in the middle of winter when it's out of growing season, yeah, you're not going to get that food. No. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I think the biggest problem with our country is we've lost our sight on God and yep. we don't believe yep. in God anymore as a majority. Yep. And when you produce food, um, I mean, we've got all the best technology um, the corn varieties and soybean hybrids have been just, they're amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we can drive through our area now and 10 years ago, 20 years You'd ago, have nothing. we would have absolutely nothing no, for a crop right now. hundred percent. Right. But we're losing a lot of money this yeah. year and there's nothing science can do about that. Nope. That's right. It's, uh, it's pretty frustrating when you're middle of July and you've had a decent amount of rain and the crop has looked really good and it's done this weather weather pattern has done this the last three years. And from the middle of July until well, just last September Saturday. 5th? September, yeah. September eleventh. Yeah. Tenth and eleventh. Right. Um Every rain that they talk about on the news, you say, well, this could be the one that makes us and breaks us. If we don't get it, yep. it could be over. And that is, that's a gut punch when you do that for a month and a half. And we didn't get it, by the way. <laughs> the one that, it's like, well, if we get this yeah. one, nope, didn't and get we, this one. Maybe we, we get never, the next one. We never got that one. And the oh. ones we would get would be maybe a 10th, mm -hmm. which doesn't I mean, do much. It helps, but yeah. it's not. Yep. going to make your crop. But, you know, just to go through that over and over and over again. And now, I, like I said, this is year three. Yep. Um, you got nothing else but to have faith in God. And mm -hmm. I I don't know that we'll be here in five years. Yeah, to be I know. honest with you, but yeah, I got to do my best to make ends meet. Right. And just have faith that uh, my eternity is secured yep and i know where i'm going when i'm done but when you got a society that doesn't, doesn't have that have that doesn't know does have no connection to what it's like the daily miracles that it has to take mm -hmm. for your food to go on your table yep. and it's not just us it's the manufacturing facilities it's the supply chain getting it right to the grocery store and i mean if you don't see it on the shelf at the grocery store and you say, well, do you have it in the back? Mm -hmm. well, there's no back room, guys. Nope. <laughs> Those days that truck gone. isn't there yet. Yep. The shelf is their storage. Yep. And that's how good we've gotten with our, our supply chain is yep. an amazing miracle in and of itself, the way that we've gotten it, gotten it dialed down. As but, long as it runs. Yeah, exactly. But I just, you know, I, I noticed this. So when I, when I went to college, I would work summer job. In construction and the first week every year I was like relearning how to use my hands mm -hmm. so the first week I would come home and I would have cuts and bruises and you know you try to pry something on you know mm -hmm. pry a nail out of yep out of uh the form and you just beat your hand up so you just you get away from something for a while and you don't understand mm -hmm. what it is and what it's like and then I mean <laughs> The shit smelled a little more shitty when I came back from working in <laughs> yes. the factory. Yes, it and went did. right into a damned hog barn. Yep, that's right. That's so, right. So I mean, you just the farther you get away from that, and I mean, the good thing again about what agriculture has done is it's gotten so effective, 
and so efficient that we've been able to specialize and people can go do other things. But at the same time, if you don't understand how precious it is that we have our food uh-huh. and we have all the extra time that we have, yep. 100%. I, just, I, I think that's our biggest problem facing us right now is we don't have any clue as a people how lucky we are mm-hmm. and how fragile it is. Mm-hmm. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. We've talked about that a lot on yeah. here that that just people just don't understand. And I mean, you can't really blame them. I mean, I think you could, you could do some things to help people learn that like maybe requiring some freaking ag classes in high school or college or whatever. So people could just even know yeah. that. I don't know if that will go into effect, but you're, it's it's that it's that problem that we became so efficient that less people have to farm. So why would they know anything about it? Yeah. Which it at least I don't know how many subjects we've talked about where we go back to this idea. I just laugh because that's all you can do. But our society, and not just our society, really something I think that is unique, and it's not it's not a hundred percent, but I don't think there's ever been a time where the entire world, with some exceptions, is as prosperous as it is today. But every, pretty much everybody thinks that we are the most advanced, smartest yeah. people that have ever inhabited the earth. We mm-hmm. got it all figured out. Mm-hmm. And I always go back and say, the Egyptians did too. The Aztecs did too. The Romans did too. Yeah. The you know whoever you want to talk, the Turks did too. The Mesopotamians did too. They all thought at their when they had it going, man, they thought yep. we got it going. We're smarter than everybody. And then guess what happened? It all went to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. You can only science the shit out of things so much. Yeah. And then, and then you know you get various. Uh, extremes as to what happens afterwards. I mean, in the case of the Roman Empire, you got the Dark Ages that lasted, what did it last, 800 years or some shit like that? And you have to relearn all this stuff. And the biggest thing, and, and that's something tying into ag, is, you know, the Europeans have subsidized agriculture for ever since World War II because... They, all those countries in Europe, knew what it was to know famine and to not have food. And they, they paid these farmers to farm 50 acres because they wanted to have a food source grown yeah. locally. And now then, you've seen what's happened in Holland and like when we talked to... Netherlands. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Huey. Yep. I mean, that's the reason they came here is because they've They're gotten away from that. You know, the farmers... Right. Um, they're taking their land. They're it's trying to sequester carbon yeah, as much as they all can. All in the name of climate change. And so now you've got food insecurity more than you ever have. And you got more people relying on us. Exactly. Yeah. And then we're all relying on the supply chain because we got so efficient. And the policies that these politicians put in place, which we talked about in our last episode, you know, the, the natural gas crisis, Russia shut down that pipe pipeline of natural gas to go to Europe. And now we say we're going to supply that to Europe, which we, we talked about the whole trickle down effect of that. But like, I asked you the question, do you think those politicians even fucking like, does it even register that that's going to happen? Like, do they realize that that's going to be the trickle down effect? And, or I, either they don't fucking know are those people that are putting those policies and policies in place. Don't fucking know the trickle down effect. Or, or they're yet. doing it on purpose. You like want to go Mao's China? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you don't, but it makes you, when I, we also said that in the last podcast, it makes you really think like if we can sit here together and sit and think about the trickle down effects of one thing that took place on the world stage and how it's going to affect farming and agriculture here in this barn, you're telling me some motherfucker from Washington, D.C. can't figure that out? Yeah, they, they know. It's... Yeah, Mao's China. I mean, they took over mm-hmm. agriculture, and I think that's kind of what they want to do here. Um, I don't remember the book. 
but I'm pretty sure it was Klaus Schwab wrote it, but he, he said, just imagine by 2030, you'll own nothing and be mm, yes. super happy about it. Yep. Yep. Um, what do you think that means? Yep. Yeah. And the, the idea of a utopian society where everybody owns nothing and is tickled shitless to work for the betterment of everybody uh, has been tried, <laughs> has been mm-hmm. has been tried so many times, and the problem with it is, is I mean it's many fold, but one of the biggest problems is that people soon figure out that some people work pretty hard at that, and then some people figure out that it's going right. to get done no matter what they do, so they don't do anything. Yeah, and then the other side of it is that for some reason. The people at the top of this experiment, they don't ever seem to want to live like the rest of the people, and they're siphoning. They're, they're a little more equal than yeah, others. Yeah, they're siphoning off the top, and I think Margaret Thatcher said it best. She said the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. Yeah, I think the world model, I don't know that China's on board with. Yeah. I don't know, you guys talk about the Great Reset. Yeah. 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 No, and I think China world economic ESGs form and all that, but I yeah. the, the model for the western world is what China has done. Yes. They've got their people subdued with the NBA. Yep. And the movies they allow to come in there. Yep. And the TikToks and the yep. the Facebooks, they've got them controlled. Dopamined on the little creature things that we as lazy humans will just gobble it up and not care about actual Real rights and freedoms. Yeah. And they, they, we've, we've talked about that too, that the one thing that the Chinese hold above everything else with their population is they figured out that they'll put up with a hell of a lot as long as they're well fed. Yeah. But if they have food insecurity, it's, that's their biggest fear. That's their biggest fear. And, um, I, I think that, I think we're at a time where it's very murky which direction things go because you've got, I'm a firm believer and it might not, it might be unpopular opinion. I don't know. I feel like more people are waking up to this just because uh, there's more information that's coming out. You know, you, you've never been able to get good information out of China at all. Um, but they've been lying about their census for years, and they're in probably one of the worst. They're in one of the worst conditions generationally of any country in the world. I think. I mean, Japan is is yeah. a textbook case. I mean, they're, they're Japan spying, their yeah. birth rate's been terrible for a long time. They're circling and, the drain. But Japan. China, they're they're headed to a they're like running the buffalo off the bluff i mean they're headed to a point where their population is going to drop so fast that their ability to manufacture and to grow their economy is just going to go into an absolute tailspin and some people think that they won't be able to keep control of it just from just from the fact that we'll explain why because some people might not know why you know they they had a they had this huge population and basically they they had famine coming out of out of uh, Mao um, and and I don't know what do they call that the, what they call that when they Mao oh what was it it was the was great it the society. great yeah the great society and um, so they had starvation and famine and they had this huge population because people just had kids like crazy because it's like here many generations ago because mm-hmm. it was cheap labor. People had kids because you had to get all this work done. It was all manual labor, and they did the same thing. So they started a policy. It was the one-child policy yep. where they only wanted you know, to have one child, and if you didn't have any kids, that was even better, and which was really hard to do because— Boys were preferred because they could work. Yeah. Yep, boys were preferred. Yeah, yep. and if you didn't have kids, you didn't have anybody to take care of you, and there wasn't any social— uh, safety net like here and they did that they did it very well they did it so well that by the time they figured out that if you don't have a birth rate 
that is above 2.2. I think 2.2 is basically per family. A maintenance. That's per family, right? Or well, that for per your person? country. If your if your birth rate is for for every person, you are adding 2.2 2. 2. 2. yeah. because you figure you figure all these all the accidents, the things that go wrong. Um, on a national scale, if you don't have a birth rate that's above 2.2, um, you're going backwards. Like 2.1, 2.2 is basically maintenance. Over a period of time, your population will stay stable. Yeah. Um, China is below that. One, I want to say China is like one of the worst in the world. I think right now it's worse than even Japan is. The United States, one of the arguments you can make is part of the reason we have such a horrible immigration policy is because when we talk about it, we like, say, can't these guys see what happened or what's happening? I think they do see what's happening. If you take out what's perceived as, or the numbers that aren't really, that are estimated for illegal immigration, if you take out what the United States birth rate really is, it's only about 1.6 or something like that. But if you figure in all the immigration, total immigration, what's estimated, we're right there about 2.2, which makes us probably the best developed nation in the world. And then you have Mexico, which is right up there too. And they're one of our biggest trading partners. So if you look at that, we're we're good on that part. We're the floatiest turd in the punch bowl. Exactly. You're exactly right. But China is in a horrible spot. So China's pretty much, they're not going to have enough young people to replace the boomers. Yeah. So this whole idea of the World Economic Forum that we need to make everybody equal and Really, what that means is the Western the Western world needs to go down. down. Yep. It we've we've spent we've spent trillions of dollars and a and however on the UN, which in my opinion was a waste of money. We should probably disband that because nothing gets done of any substance there. But I could be wrong. But we spent an awful lot of money trying to bring up the uncivil, or not the uncivilized, but your third world countries, right. the undeveloped part of the world. We've we've spent a pile of money doing that, and we really haven't gotten a good return on our money. So now then the idea is, well, if we can't do that, we'll just bring everybody else down. Right. And I don't know. I, I feel like if you asked me two years ago, I, I would have thought, I think I'd be more scared of that than what I am today. Because today I feel like, the wheels are starting to come off right. on all of this. And not that that's good because I feel like the wheels are kind of coming off on everything. And now it's kind of a crapshoot what we're going to get. Right. But I don't have much faith that we're going to fix it, that we're going to fix it or that the people on the hard left are going to get what they want. I think we could all end up with something a lot worse. Yeah. Like we could end up in complete disarray we could end up in a civil war we could end up having a famine in the western well i don't think it will be yeah i think i don't think it'll be left's gonna win because i think there's enough people on the opposition in this country to say they are not gonna let you do what you want to do there's gonna be if it if they go that far there's gonna be a point a where a lot of pushback there is going to be a point in this country where where people are going to put their foot down and say enough's enough. We're not doing this shit. Yeah, what scares me though is so the opposition party to what the left is doing. I mean, they're I mean, we call them the party of stupid, but they're yeah. really not. They're the party of I'm in this with you and we're going to make some damn money. Party of apathy. You can vote R all you want, but if you're not putting the right mm-hmm dude behind that R or woman behind that R we've been voting they're just they're, we're going to go we're going to go with the democrats but we're just not going to go quite as fast mm-hmm. we're going to go off the cliff but we're just going to go about 5 mile an hour yeah we've been voting for the lesser of two evils for how many generations yes and i'll tell you something else you can take local we touched on this a little bit last week talking about thinking local But I'll give you a great example of how we ended up where we are and why we end up with the kind of candidates we end up with. So um, I was was an elder in the church that I grew up in. And um, 
that's that's you know that's an interesting little microcosm of of politics because you have competing people within a congregation that think we ought to do this or think we ought to do this mm-hmm. or how's the you know I don't like this pastor I don't want you know whatever I think the number one reason churches dissolve is because they can't agree on the songs that they're singing <laughs> or, or are we gonna yeah, I heard that stat one is yeah. they, they fall apart because yeah, uh, you want to do the new agey stuff and yeah. I don't want to do the old timey gospel stuff yep. yeah well, within that, within that, and that you know, this is a this is an old, what I call an old line religion. You know, one of the Methodist, uh, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist. You know, one of those, one of those groups. Um, so they had a national, they had a they had a regional council, and then they had a national council. You know, and and yeah. they would have these meetings. Well, they would schedule these meetings. You know, middle of the week. And um, for all the decisions that were voted on, both like in the Midwest and then the national. Okay, well, who can go to that? Right. So the people that go to that are retired liberal school teachers. Mm -hmm. So on our our board at our church, there were uh, pretty equally split, some farmers, some business owners, and then some retired people. And a lot of those retired people happen to be school teachers and very liberal school yep. teachers. Well, guess who's got time to go to the press, to the, the meeting for the Midwest and the meeting for the national retired school teachers. Yep. So then you do that. You do that for decades and decades yep. and decades. And when I got off of that, uh, circus, I swore I'd never do it again. And we actually, we actually left the church and it wasn't about my local church. That isn't why I left. Although I had some disagreements with the pastor we had and all that. It was because the national policy of that church was they wouldn't invest their pension, wouldn't invest in any company that did business with Israel Mm -hmm. and they wanted Israel declared a terrorist Mm -hmm. deal. That was the straw that broke the camel's back and they had a vote on it and that passed. And that was when I said, I'm done. Yeah. And I, I, when I started that, I was like, how could people think that? And then I just thought, I'm like, well, you've been sending the same minded people to do this yep. for all these years. Okay. Back out national politics, people who run for pol- people who run for political office today do it for political gain. Yes. They do it for personal gain. They don't do it as a duty to their country right. as it was intended. Yeah. And we have been sending him there for generations. And today we all sit around and bitch and we wonder, why do they vote this way? Or we say, how could you look at this problem and not think mm-hmm. that it needs to be fixed this way? Because you're looking at it as how can I enrich myself my yeah. family. and the people, my family and the people that put me in power? Politics is um, Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> <laughs> Basically all it is. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. That is it awesome. Is. And yeah, they're all, they're all getting rich. They're skimming yeah. their theirs off. Yeah, yeah. Is know. there a, is there a um, is there a uh, what do they call that when you just invest in the whole market? S and P five hundred. No, but like stock market? index fund. Index. Yeah. Is there an index fund that just goes off of what Nancy Pelosi? No, but there are TikTok accounts and people that literally just follow her trade, follow her <laughs> trades, and to say, "Oh, Nancy did this today." Because yeah. they her well, it's technically her husband is the yeah. one that makes that. Yeah. Well, yeah, she's not trading. She owns right. nothing. Nope. nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know, I, and I also think a big a big part of that also is indoctrination of kids. You know, oh, yeah. they're these. I mean, pretty much every university you go to nowadays, it's rare if you if you go to one that isn't completely left all the way yeah. i mean they're they try to push that on to you in every level even in high school even yeah. i mean every level you're getting pushed to the left yeah. and that's on purpose because they might not switch you guys over yeah to become part of the agenda that they want to push but they've been pushing the agenda down on yeah younger generations for however long yeah. and it's just a matter of time for you yeah. guys pass away and now I'm the old fucker, and I, you're not saying you guys are old, but you know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. now the old fucker yeah. that's well, like, you're the minority. what the hell, what the hell happened? Why, what's going on with all these young kids? Well, do you, do you feel that you're a minority within your demographic? 
Yes and no. I, I, I want to say more. I think a lot of information's come out, and especially with COVID and stuff, there's a lot of young kids that are like, they, they see through the bullshit. Do you feel like the government and we, and we don't with COVID? And we, let me just finish. And I don't think we trust what is told to us, like, with face value. Like, we want to see, go through it, see the information, look at it all. I don't know, maybe not. I don't. But I think just a lot of young kids are seeing that CNN's full of shit. Fox News is full of shit. All of them are full of shit. We're going to yeah. dig a little deeper to find out what's actually going on. And that's promising. If if people would realize that Fox News is just as bad as yes. CNN and all them others, I mean, they, yeah, we'd have a chance. Yeah, yep. you know, because we're like, why the fuck does Grassley still getting elected? Well, I yeah. know. Because I know. nobody he knows the, there's another alternative. He is right. And he, we don't he's get the off our, we don't get off Fox News at night yep. to go vote in the primary. Yep. So he's just. Grassley is one of the examples that I would give of us voting for the lesser of evils because I, at this point, I bet you that 60% of his vote is from people, if you asked them, they're going to say, yeah. well, yeah, I don't, you know, we should get somebody new in there, but I'm not voting for right. so-and-so. Right. I don't even know who's running against him. I don't know. But um, Frank, is it Franken? Frank, Michael Franken? Franken? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know anything about Michael Franken, but I know he's I know he's a Democrat. He, I tell you, I've noticed the commercials. They are more right wing, the Democrats, than I have ever seen. Yeah. The uh, Congress lady's like, we need to crack down on China. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Whoa. They're throwing out all the hot buttons that yeah. they don't have to do anything They're about, but they rah, rah, it sounds sis, good. Goomba, we're America, bitch. Love it or leave it. Now yeah. for some reason. Yep. No, I, I mean. You look at all the governments throughout history, like we claim to be, we're not a religious nation and yeah. you know, we're not founded on religion, even though we were. We were completely. But every country that's ever existed always runs on some type of a theology. Yes. Right now, our theology is science. Mm -hmm. Right now, our theology is we can improve the world. We yep. are. Yep. We're we, smarter. We are the people who built the Tower of Babylon. Yes. Or the right? Tower of Babel. Yep. We're so smart, we can out science science, and we're just going to. Yep. So anybody who says, well, you know, droughts have always happened. Yep. Um, thank God for global warming or we'd still be under a mile of ice. Yep. You know, they think we need to control the environment. Well, thank God that. God controls the environment, and we didn't have a say in it, or we wouldn't be here right now. And we can right. control the environment till we can't. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, it's like well, we yeah, can do all of this stuff. Yeah, and what's to say we shield the sun enough to the point where we go into, you know, a, I, a yeah. mini ice age like yeah. happened 300 years ago or whatever it was? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a. It's well, a I always I always say. Yeah, all this, all this uh, global warming stuff's great, but if everybody in the world doesn't get on the train, what's the fucking point? Yeah, we can do everything here in the United States to be pro climate, but if no one else is on board, yeah, then what the fuck are we doing all this shit Which, for? Yeah. And the other thing I say is, I wish that they wouldn't push it down so hard. I know that the reason they do it is because there's so many people that are going to financially gain from a new industry booming. Hundred percent, mm -hmm. but. I'm not against, I'm not completely anti all that shit. Nope. But I'm, I'm anti against it. Let's push it as fast as we possibly fucking can down these people's throats. Like everybody wants, to, they're telling us everybody should have an EV. Is the electrical grid even fucking ready for that? Yeah. Or, I mean, they're shutting down California because yeah. they yeah. have yeah. too many EVs. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's great. We can, we can, we can innovate to a better, whatever you want to say, but we got to do it at a reasonable rate. Yeah. Yeah, the the we talked about this with the with the inflation fighter uh, pork barrel bill about the EV tax credit, which they didn't they didn't need that at all. And you know, uh, like Elon, he's he said it. We don't need any of that. Right. And you know, as we're talking today, there's a guy over uh, measuring out put solar on my other hog building. I'm not buying solar because I'm gonna get. I'm going to get a kickback. 
I am going to get a tax credit for it, but I put it on. I would be putting it on even if they weren't because I've got it on one of my other buildings. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's financially, it, it works like it works. The, the numbers work. Okay. Stuff like that is just going to happen. If you just get out of the way and let people do it. And I think it's great. I, I think it's a good deal for me. Solar works. Now, does it work for you if you got it in town and you put it on your house? I don't know whether that makes enough sense, cost versus benefit. But in the hog business, for the volume of power that I use and that I've got this big, I've got this big roof that I can cover with solar panels, that makes sense. Yeah. And I'd do it whether I was getting a tax credit or not because I know it works. But to shove it, you're 100% right. This idea that we're just going to move everybody that doesn't work because the system is not ready for that. Yeah. And that's where they get it wrong. They just plain ass get it wrong. Or do they? Well, that's the, that that's the crazy the thing. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. It's to look at it all and realize how that shit freaking stupid is. It, it is. You got to think, well, they're not that dumb, are they? And they probably aren't. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there, I'd say I'll, like I, I've used COVID for the last I don't know how many podcasts as an example of they are pretty fucking calculated, obviously, because yeah. that was cal- I mean that whole thing was calculated, and I think the the whole idea of pushing global warming like Florida's gonna fucking get sink. flooded and sink and be <laughs> gone, that is a an extreme version of that exact thing that COVID was where. If they're telling us that oh the whole United States is going to get the southern part of the United States is going to be fucking gone, why are the banks financing? Why are investors down there? Why, why can are you still getting sure? Why are you getting? Yeah, house. I mean these places wouldn't fucking finance these areas. Like it's bullshit. It's it why that do- that extreme push. I don't buy one whatsoever. The- maybe maybe a little bit of global warming is happening, but the extreme fucking push that you put it just pushes me further back the big pushers of it all got a house on the ocean they all yep drive around in their private yachts and they all fly their private jets Jets. all over the world not to your point sir like i'm gonna do this on my own i'm gonna become more environmentally conscious i i mean we used to tear up all of our fields up until a couple years ago but you you look at your field and your creek has now become silted in with all of my topsoil that yep. I'm never going to get back. Yep. So I'm, I'm moving there eventually on my own. Um, I went to a strip till meeting at Iowa state last fall and I'm, I'm interested in doing it. I want to do it. And beforehand they gave a little spiel. They're like, well, yeah, you know, we've got these car. Let's just talk about these carbon credits He's like, it's coming, and all these big companies are going to invest in it, and they're going to give you incentives to do this. And I was like, why are they giving away their money to us to farm? Well, you know, it's because they can offset their carbon credits or offset their carbon credits. Well, I didn't know at the time about the plan of the World Economic Forum and the ESG stuff. Yep. Well, now it's all coming together. Yep. Now it's all making sense. I mean, eventually, I I mean, I, I want to do strip tilling. It gives me a great seed bed, and we all know that emergence is the most damned important thing you can have yep. when it comes to a, a viable or a most potential in your crop. Yep. And I would even go um, down the line of um, cover crops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know about, I don't give two shits about sequestering carbon. Yep. I just want to rebuild my topsoil yep. and build a more fertile seed yep. bed. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like, I I don't understand that sequestering carbon thing because yeah. like so we're pulling stuff out of the air, and it is going in the soil. But when the when the rye dies, doesn't it give off CO two and go back into the air? Mm-hmm. I don't understand how there's a. Yep. I'm not. I, they yeah, may be right, it, but I just don't get it. And it's a it's a. Well, it's a shell game. Yeah, and the whole thing that I just yeah. the carbon credit thing is weird to me because we're gonna us as farmers are gonna sell our the amount of carbon we sequestered to a corporation that is releasing a shitload of CO two so they can look good on paper. That's yeah. exactly right. I mean, well, that's what's yeah. what's the <laughs> that's it. That don't yeah. I 
because then it's like, I just, that's weird to me. You are still going to be releasing all the CO2 in the atmosphere. These companies are going to buy these carbon credits. But if us as farmers sell them those carbon credits, all it is is just your image to how yeah. you look. Oh, look at us. We bought all these carbon and credits. Well, some yeah. people are like, uh, I just watched Ch- China put up 50 new coal plants this year. Yeah. yeah. And they burn the dirtiest coal there is. They don't give a shit. But we don't breathe that air here. No. Yeah. No. That is, you're 100% right. I mean, that's what we were talking about when Russ was here is that, you know, these companies. And I mean, hell, yeah, if it's going to be a good enough incentive for us as farmers, I think a lot more farmers will probably do it. But on paper, to me, with the explanation I just gave, that's a little odd. It's a little it, bit of a, I mean, it just sounds You're not fixing weird. anything. No, you're not. You're not fixing anything. Right. All you're doing is shifting money. You're yeah. just moving yeah. money. Yeah. You're transferring. It's and so much of what has happened in this country is a tra- is a is a a transfer of wealth. I mean that's what it is. It's yeah. a transfer of wealth. Um, these companies they're going to pay pay somebody for a made up basically pay them to do a practice that they may or may not have already been doing just so that they can take that off their balance sheet for their ESG score yeah. that they look better. I mean it's just another it's just another quota. It's mm-hmm. just another quota. Yeah, and they, they get the sense of playing God, too, mm-hmm. I think. There's a little God complex to some of these yeah. planners. Well, there and that's, you know, that goes back to your earlier point that, you know, we, we, we've lost, we've lost our, we've lost our faith as a country, as a country. I mean. Well, yeah, I, if you really want me to piss people off, we put ourselves as God. And we, oh. all, we all do it. We're all selfish, and that's yeah. our that's our nature. Mm-hmm. You know, the first sin was you be like God. Yep. The devil. Yep. He wanted to be God. Yep. And we do. Like, the idea of climate, the idea of right. that we can fix the climate. Right. We think that we can fix anything, and it's the idea of AI, and it, we can build artificial intelligence that's right. smarter right. than the smartest human. Mm-hmm. We can play God. We can grow. We can grow people. We can take clone DNA, people. We clone, clone dogs. People. Have you seen that freak? That's like, yeah, we figured out a way that we can actually hack into people's DNA. Have you seen that guy? No, I haven't seen that guy. That guy's fun. Why? Well, yeah. What is that? Uh, How do you suppose that gets in you? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to know something that's required that we all have to take. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> if not, sure. we're killing grandma. It's facts. Grandpa. It's, it's, it's all, all out there. It's all and out all there. That, but all that goes back to this idea that we are, we don't need, we don't need a faith in anything. We don't need God because yeah. we are. And it's, well, and it's, I'll make my statement. Our faith should be in the government. That's what, it, that's what they yeah. want. Our faith should be in the government to take care of us and not in higher power or God or whatever. That's. That's you, what they want. Have you guys ever watched J.P. Sears on YouTube? Huh. Yes, I haven't. Yes. Yeah, he's he's that long haired guy. He's always he's always got his shirt off. <laughs> oh yeah 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 like yeah. He doesn't make skits. He gives the reasons about. I don't you know, know how I don't know how the fuck he's still on there. I don't, I don't either. either because he does it with satire. Uh, I think they apparently think, they think that he's full of shit and he apparently doesn't a good enough job of not crossing the line. Not maybe using I don't know. the trigger words that but. I don't I feel like he ever doesn't say I don't know how he I stays pretty much on. understand exactly what the hell he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So what do you what do you think what do you think what can we do? What do you think like what advice would you give to farmers now that we're going into this hard ass time? I mean, we're gonna go through a hard year this year, but next year's gonna be hard with inputs too. Like yeah. do you have any advice? Do you have anything that you're trying to do on your farm to help you get through these hard times? Raise his custom rates. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we're we're taking on a little bit more uh, manure work this fall, which thank God we're fortunate enough we can can do that. Um, pinch pennies, man. Yep. Great like hell, and I I really don't. Don't you yeah. think we should take our fertilizer dealer probably out behind the barn and just just see how see how close to the, the end we, we can, can yeah get out of him get out of him. We share the same fertilizer yeah, dealer, I, so. I'm down for that. Maybe we could just get him to buy some shit for us or yeah. take us out golfing or something. 
I think it's about all we're going to get. I'm afraid that's all we're going to get because yeah. I don't think he has any control. No, he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us that his costs are. If he, he, I can already hear it. It's going to be, oh, man, you think you got it bad. I mean, no, no. my suppliers, oh, it's, I mean, I got to pay for it two weeks before I even get it. It's I terrible. Even, I don't it's even terrible. know what it's going to be. I mean, you're lucky I'm even here. You're lucky I'm even in business. I sh- we just, we, we were almost going to quit last week. I, I asked him about another product. It's not something they do, but it's something I'd like to do. And he's like, well, I was going to do that, but I got to build a whole nother shed to store it in. So yeah. you tell him it doesn't appear that you have any trouble doing that. You build <laughs> sheds every year. Yeah. Oh, that's just to put your toys in. Sorry. Dude, their nitrogen. We're kind of banging on him now. Did you hear about their nitrogen storage thing? It busted yeah. a hole and. Yep. Heck of a deal. Spent a whole pile of money on that. And then last year, nobody even knew if anybody was going to use it. Yeah, didn't know nitrogen. if they were going to have it. It's but, not easy work either. We no. give them a hard time, but we need them. They're good guys to deal with. So. Yeah, I, as far as. I don't know, man. Enjoy the little things. Yep. Mm hmm. Uh, this next coming five years whatever it's going to take enjoy the little things like if you think your republican or your democrat's going to solve it for you yeah <laughs> not going to happen better, you better start investigating who they are and what they're yeah. all about mm-hmm. and that'll be at least a read up three, on some history fix read what? up on your history know what the hell has happened yep. before yep. but i mean if you don't know god find him yep pray a lot believe in him Mm -hmm. and know that things could go real bad yep and people might start starving to death i don't think it'll start here yep well it's like shay said he's like i know how i know how to find my food yeah he's like you know i know how to grow my food i know how to grow my food i know how to feed my family but if you guys don't think you need us Knock yourself out. Yeah, cornmeal is going to get old after a while. It will. Yeah. <laughs> cornmeal. Salted pork and cornmeal. Yeah. Well, that's just it. Like, I got two freezers full of plenty of meat. Yeah. My in-laws do cattle and we do hogs. Do hogs. So I got all the food groups covered. Yep. Um, but if we don't have any damn power. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Then we're down. We to need corn, to get those back. I have to open up, the, open up the door to the hog barn. Just. Get us some fence built. Oh, try to man. try to go that route go if the electricity <laughs> electricity goes out. I don't know. Yeah, the, the green weenies like they never drove drove through the country in the eighties and saw everybody's cargill where after soon a as, rainstorm. Soon as you get, yeah, as soon as you get a two inch rain, you're done hauling manure for yep. the year. Yep. It just went right down the damn creek. <laughs> oh, it's it, yeah, I mean that those arguments are just <laughs> it it all comes down to scale. I mean, all the stuff that we get dinged about from people that want to grow, they want to go down this road that ag should be much more diversified and smaller and, you know, pasture raise this. That's all fine, but you cannot feed a civilization. Yeah. You cannot do it at scale. And you, you want to, if, and you guys are a great example. We're a great example. Just about everybody that owns a damned hog barn here is a great example of a large factory farm. Yeah. Supporting hundreds of family farms. Mm-hmm. Even the people that don't have a hog barn maybe work for them. Yep. Or they sell grain to them. Our our grain basis around here now is phenomenal. Yes. Because we've got so many buyers here, and that's yep. going to get a lot of us through this. Mm-hmm. Well, our through town. Through the drought and then all the economic shit show that we're our county doing. Our county. You, you can talk economic development, and we've talked about this before, but our county would not have our roads would be would not be paved if it wasn't for all of the animal agriculture that is done in our yeah. county yeah. it it is the biggest financial uh driver in in our county mm-hmm. absolutely it is mm-hmm. and like you said it it also it enhances the profitability of all the other parts of ag the grain the grain side of it is enhanced for having that agri that animal agriculture. Mm-hmm. So anyway, well, I guess we we kind of went down a tangent there, a little bit of doom and gloom. But let's get into the, some of the things that excite you in the next five years when it comes to ag. What what excites you when it comes to ag? Coming so up, I, I I am excited. So we just shat all over science and technology. Well, kind of ish. You know, we can science the shit out of everything. But I do see a lot of promise in technology. We yep. just put that harvest lab on our manure bar. Yep. 
which is another reason why I'm not spending any money for the next five years. Yeah. <laughs> We've spent a lot the last two years. Um, but I mean, that'll, that'll tell us what we're getting out of our, out of our manure. I don't know if you guys have covered this before with your, just a little bit. So, um, explain how this works because every fall we, we drag line our manure. David, David comes and he's got a drag line, um, where we pump the manure straight from the bar, from the barn to his toolbar and it goes straight on the ground, which is awesome because we don't have all, we don't have that tank traffic and we're not driving up and down the road and it's just a lot more efficient. We get it done a lot faster, but, um, the rate, you basically set a, a set rate. We're going to say we're going to put on uh, 4,000 gallons the acre or whatever our manure management plan is based on what our crop yield history has been. But your manure, as you're pumping it out of that barn, it varies. It, the nutrient as, value. The nutrient value yeah. varies a lot. And so explain what you've done that yeah. you've changed. So as Torque was saying, you got three major um, nutrients in the manure that you're really concerned about the N, the P and the K. <clears throat> and as you're going down through the levels of the pit, there's sp- basically three different stratification levels that they've noticed with this harvest lab machine, but you have different levels of all three of those elements in P and K. You got typically more N at the top and more P and K at the bottom. That's usually held in your solids. However, the stuff at the top is more of your like ammonium nitrate, which loves to vanish right away. And then you get more actual nitrates that stick around in the bottom. But what this machine does is it will show us live the amount of NP and K that we're getting per thousand gallons of manure. So that's how we know how much we're put, or that's how we determine what to put on is our application rate via the DNR is based in thousands of gallons per acre. So we can either go up to your limit Mm. with the amount and just go full amount. And then it just tells you and it maps on your field. So on this acre, you got 220 pounds of N, um, 180 pounds of K and 180 pounds of P. Yep. So then you can take that information and then go back and determine how many and determine gallons. how much if you can variable rate your side dressing or your and your PK later. Yep. Mm. So that's basically how that's going to work for us. Um, I was talking to said fertilizer chemical dealer. Yep. And he told me that, well, yeah, you get your manure done and give me our maps that we make, and they will adjust our rate of P and K for what they apply. For what they apply this fall. Yep. The issue is going to be: Am I going to get it all done, and will they have time to get it on before? Yep. The snow flies, but I, I, don't know, I suppose they can do it next spring too. But yeah, well, if nothing else, one nice thing about it is that if you we know what we're getting now, we never knew that yeah, before. That's exactly right, and that's and that's what I had before. Is we have you know, like we have three barns that went on one field last year, and. You know, you, you dip in. I think you guys have done the video on yep on YouTube Taking before. Your manure but you sample. dip in and you take your manure sample, but all three barns are different, and then you know that all three pits change as you pump. And then when you go to side dress again next spring or do your nitrogen plan, well, you don't know what's where for nitrogen. Yep, so that's you don't know exactly if that's your right. limiting factor or not. Yep. So, I mean, that's, so that's a pretty exciting thing that I'm excited to get going on this fall. Did you see us in the furrow? You no, get the furrow I didn't magazine, see it there. The middle fold out where they have the advertisement. They really? Got, they got a picture of our bar there. Really? Nice. All you can see is basically the little box, the top of our, yep. um, <laughs> of our bar, and then our two feed bins in the background. Do you get the residuals off that? Yeah, we had a we had a field day at our place where John Deere came out and nice. gave their spiel and our wannabe politician was there. Yes, right. She <laughs> No idea. Yep. I don't think she figured out what exactly was going on, but I'm sure she was impressed. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um so I, I see potential there. Um more cost, data. Cost more savings. Again, I gotta spend money to make money, but yep. cost savings. And then if if I want to I want to fully implement it and go all the way with my nitrogen application. 
I'm going to have to variable rate and I don't have anything to variable rate and the bars I rent don't variable rate. So, nope, Nope. that's right. So, I mean, we're a few years off there, but I'll be glad to know what I got, where I got it. And I think I can start saving on P and K now. Yeah. Well, when it comes to nitrogen, you're not going to be able to afford to buy any extra nitrogen anyway. Uh, So you don't need to variable rate it. Which is a real kick because I think, so I had about five extra acres of um, nitrogen when I side dressed. Yeah. And I was put on 50 pounds side dressing. So I had to go back over it. And that is the greenest, nicest looking, best corn. Yep. And I'm afraid my results after a dry year are going to be, I have 500 pounds of nitrogen. Yep. But. I, I mean, that's, I think you're right. I mean, that's true. I mean, I've seen it because I've had up, up here where I had to go back and fill mm-hmm. when I was side dressing. So I just turned around and went right back down the row. Yeah. And when you pull in and take the ends off, it's like, wow, 298. This you know, is going to be great. Torque's going to love this year. Yeah. <laughs> and. Yeah, because it got an extra hundred pounds of nitrogen on it. Yeah, but um, so there's there's that the um, we've already implemented this um, with our drag hose system. You guys do a do a nice little um, what do you call it? Computer generation. Oh yeah, yeah, si- yeah. Um, yeah. Simulation later of how we used to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, we know we used to go at an angle, forty-five degree. Yep. But on our flat and square stuff, I'm trying. To, I'd want to get you guys figured out because you would love it. I know we, we want to do, do it. it here. We'll just cut. Can we just cut off some of those corners and just put them in hay? Well, shrink your fields. Well, Sawyer's girlfriend wants a horse real bad. Ooh. So you know, uh, in a perfect world, we'll just take those spots we can't do it. We'll just make that into alfalfa and just bale hay on it. You're not man enough. You're not horse enough for her. I don't know what I am, but I know that (laughs) she said she's going to do bulk of the work and I'm not going to have to do much. And if she's going to pay for it, have at it. Bulk. Bulk Bulk of the work. work. Uh, But anyway, so we used to have to go at an angle with this drag hose, but we figured out a way we can go with the rows. And now we, we invested in RTK four years ago, three years ago. And then last year we invested in implement guidance so all of our land last year we did uh, manure in furrow with a drag line system so i went back this spring and i no tilled right into that yep so I'm, I'm interested to see the results um i did have 24 rows on one of my fields where i worked the outside pass with the field cultivator and I, I, I clicked on the one I was supposed to be on, but when I got to where um, I could see the tracks from the manure bar, I realized I was off 15 inches. Oh, you were so right I, in the middle. So I quick shifted it, and you could see up until, like, V7. Right to the what row. Was, what was in it and what wasn't in it. Yeah, I so believe it's, that. It's, I don't, I don't know. To me, I, I just think we're going to get more out of – our nutrients. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I think we have to. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and in another, I mean, going forward for us in the future, I would even want to side dress with manure if I yes, could. Yes. I agree. Um, and I think we're going to get to the point where we're going to find out as we find out, uh, this goes back to when we were talking to Russ. Um, there's a lot in that manure that we're not utilizing that we're not accounting for yeah a lot of the micro nutrients that yeah. are in that yeah that we don't even worry about that we could that we could activate maybe a bio cow activates mm-hmm. that and we're not sure how yeah we don't know yeah i i would totally agree with that too yep but i think we're going to get better because i think we're going to have to because i think commercial fertilizer is just going to keep going up yeah. i mean and to me so to me like we can do the carbon credits or we can just level the playing field let's all pay 10 percent flat tax just yeah. be done with it you know, we, oh. we, we all we all know what we're going to pay is going to be 10 percent yeah and then we are free to invest in what, what we, we want to invest in mm-hmm. i mean the the tax code now is so jacked up that if we we'd have a, to get rid if, of we just hired we're just going to hire these eighty-seven thousand agents need to have to turn around and get <laughs> rid of them 
If we you make put yeah. them people bought on the street, David. If we make a profit, we got to quick go pay down loans or spend money on something. Yep. Because we can't make a profit. Cause right. We'll end up paying. You'll end up having an IRS 100, agent 100, showing up at your door with three hundred thousand dollars in taxes. The Glock on his hip. Yeah. <laughs> because right. they're armed for whatever reason. They are. Yeah. They're, they're buying right. it up. Yep. So. Well, David's armed. Yeah, I know he's armed. I brought. He's strapped. <laughs> We've had a bit of a dry year here. I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but I told Torque and Sawyer this was a rain event in Washington County this summer. <laughs> Just a nice little squirt. Just a nice little Couple squirt. squirt. I thought that, maybe you had vodka in that. And that yeah, was I did too. Talk. Honestly, when you I, shut up and said I brought, what did you say? I got the rainmaker or something. Yeah. I was like, I was like, wow, are we going to do, do some shots we're with this do thing? Unity shots. No, out I, of this. I'm not. I'm not into vodka. That supports Russia, and I'm pro Ukraine. <laughs> Tequila. Yeah, I'd do some tequila. <laughs> yeah. I prefer I prefer the Kentucky stuff. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. That's if it was a little later, we would do a pre-harvest. Uh, no, I think we should. Shot. Kentucky, We're Kentucky, gonna... and Scotland. Those, those are my. There two. you go. Uh, um, favorites. So. We're getting we're getting closer to the end here. We, it's been a good talk so far, but what, what with all this uncertainty coming, and then some of the things that excite you, what drives you to keep going, even though we're heading towards uncertain. a hard and uncertain times? What dr- what drives you to stay a farmer and just keep going and, and the doing? Motivation this? is lacking on certain days. Yep. Yes, especially like this fall with I don't know what's out there. I, we're going to be surprised in good ways and bad ways. Both. Yep. I mean, we're going to say. How did it do that? Yep. And we're going to say, wow, that's kind of what I expected. Yep. So the motivation this fall has been very low. Um, yeah, the political events and all the things that happened with COVID and just the kind of shit that they're putting on us is it knocks you down quite a bit when things are broken and it, t- it takes money to fix them. That knocks you down, but... I love the challenge. Um, I love the abuse. Um, no, I just, I believe that we are working for something here. Yeah. We are working for our future. I'm working for my kids yep. and my wife. Um, and it's. I'm working, I'm working based on, you know, what my family has done in the past. Yeah. And I want to see that continue. Legacy. And at the end of the day, it's still a damn good life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, There's a lot of negative shit sometimes, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you're feeding people. You're feeding people. You're giving some people a need. You're you're giving people a need. Yeah. You're helping in a massive way. Yeah, I told you about the other jobs I had, you know, the yeah. plumbing and then all steel and now farming. I mean, in all of them, shit all rolls downhill. Yep. So it's all. Now you've just moved to the bottom where you the catch same it all. Every, it's the same every way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What do you do for fun? Oh, geez. I like to, so the kids are getting into sports, so I've been helping kind of coach that a little bit. Are you, um, are they soccer age, uh, yeah, little league? Yeah. Um, Ainsley is in middle school now, and she's been doing softball. She's done all the soccer. I don't think she was into that, but she's still in softball, um, and she's in band. So I don't have much on hands with her as far as that goes. Um, but Dawson is seven now, and he's getting into uh, baseball, and he was in soccer. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of helping coaching the the 8U team there next year. Nice. Um, and Drew's just kind of getting in on that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, spend time with the kids. Um, they love fishing. Um, Are you a state fair? goers uh we are um the last two years we went on pretty substantial camping trips we went to south dakota last year which was a fantastic time and then we went to the smoky mountains this year yeah how was that it was good those bastards get rain every fucking day though (laughs) yep that's why you all those all those uh tiktok videos there's always that fog rolling through the low places and they uh-huh. don't tell you it's because it just finished raining yeah, like an finished, hour before yeah. that yeah so we got rain on every day down there and i'm watching the well i kind of gave up watching the radar and looking at the weather yeah <laughs> around here because it don't matter anymore it just forked every yeah. time forked 
So anyway, but yeah, we, we did that for, so we love camping for vacation. Um, we have done the state fair. We don't camp the whole time. If we do, dad'll, dad'll go up and camp and he usually spends four or five days there. Uh, we'll go up and spend maybe two, but yeah, we just got back from spending, down there spending a fat fortune in Tennessee. Yeah. So you and weren't much. We huh? were, we were wore out and just didn't really want to go to the state fair this year, but, yeah. uh, yeah, we do like four kids are in four H. So we're in all that four H stuff. Um, we do the County fair basically all week. I have been known to enjoy the spirits and the finer yes. alcoholic beverages of life. So I, I kind of get into that every now and then too. Yep. Um, whew. Yeah. You can smell it rolling oh, off. I don't buddy. know what Sawyer's got. Sawyer's got going there. My, Buffalo trace. Uh, oh, that's a good choice. That is a good choice. That's a good choice. I went with uh, some buddies down on the bourbon trail. Did you? Last summer. Which brought up the whole argument of, well, aren't you getting the vaccine? I was like, why am I getting the vaccine? I've got purifying a, my system right I got now. A, yeah, I got a hundred percent chance of surviving if I get the virus. Yeah, basically. So, where all did you go when you did the when you did the, the bourbon trail? The bourbon trail. We were stationed out of Louisville. Yep. We stayed at the KOA there. I took our camper down. Me and four buddies. Uh, but we went to Buffalo Trace. We really went down because there's a Maker's Mark deal. You yep. can get in on the, you can buy a barrel or whatever yeah. it's called, be an ambassador, I think is what it is. So we were going down for that. So we got a tour there. Uh, but went to Buffalo Trace, Wild Turkey. Damn, um, a lot of good ones. Quite a few of them, but there was still they were still COVID style. Yeah. So mm. we didn't. Get, get the whole do, experience. Get the whole experience. And and to do it, like, well, we were talking to a couple that was there, and they're like, yeah, just, I mean, do a tour and one, maybe two of them, and maybe do a couple different kinds of tours. But they're like, once you've seen one, don't go to yeah. the rest of them. Just go to the others and check out the gift shop and do yeah, some tasting. Because it's and, similar. They're all similar. But, the thing that surprises me the most or has surprised me the most when I kind of – got interested in in bourbon and whiskey and that kind of happened during covid when you have plenty of time you're yeah, not going anywhere else to sit around and sample your, your stuff and check rolling in yeah and, and read up on it but you take like buffalo trace they make they make like how many bourbons they make they Quite make because they make they make weller mm -hmm. they make pappy van winkle mm -hmm. then they make all of their stuff and do they make E.H. Taylor too? I think so. They make all those. You just don't you don't realize uh, how much consolidation there really is. Yeah, Marketing. that was okay. And yeah, we went there. We went to Buffalo Trey. I, th I think that was it. But I got a bottle of E.H. Taylor. Yeah, that was the place to get it, and yeah. I haven't touched it yet. Yeah. But. Well, no, because you kind of like you. <laughs> you're like, well, I probably shouldn't just tap into this because it's. Thursday night. I, I could probably sell it now and buy like 10 other bottles yeah. or something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I got, I poured y'all a little shot. I think it's a shot, but so I think we our, should do a harvest. Like what? What is it like? Is it, is that it's, get you? It's enough. Will that go down the it's pipe? Enough. It's enough? It'll, it'll it's, warm the cockles. It's yeah. early. I think it is a little early, but I think it's, it's, we should do this. It's afternoon somewhere. Yeah. It's, it's getting there. It's five o'clock somewhere. Some we start this, uh, this, I think this is fitting to how, how harvest is probably going to go. <laughs> Have you guys, so I was at the, uh, the winter show in Des Moines last year. Yeah. You can send a distiller somewhere in Western Iowa, like a tote full of your corn. And they'll make you whiskey. No kidding. Oh, that's cool. For a substantial fee. Oh, uh, yeah. But they will make whiskey out of your corn. And you can, like, you can... Custom think, bottle and stuff, I too? I think you can label it like your farm or something like that. No that, kidding. That, that, that would be sweet. We got to look into that. Well, yeah, that well, cool. we'll start with bourbon. And then by the time harvest is over, Shine. what will you bring... No, I was thinking more like if enough stuff breaks, we're oh, probably down to like yeah, we'll, we'll PBR be, we'll or be down to Keith Stone or yeah, <laughs> Keith Stone because it's all we it's all we could afford. Because if it goes really good, we'll we'll break open that bottle that you've been sitting on. What was it called? Uh, oh, Taylor. Uh, no, um, 
uh, 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 Blanton's. Blanton's. Um, well, or or that Blue Run, or if somebody sends me a bottle of uh, Brulotti Black Art, <laughs> which isn't going to happen, but I'd love to have a <laughs> bottle of that. So I just keep throwing it out there. Is oh, there oh, you're throwing that out to you. People like yeah. the bourbon talk. I don't know, they love it. So yeah. maybe somebody will send us a bottle someday. We'll, well, we'll hang it up and put your name on it. On we just we got to be careful not to go down the the line of the bourbon bros. Like we don't want to be too pretentious. And yeah, no, no pinkies up for like this. We gotta, yeah, we got to drink our bush lights and our mill lights every now. Yeah, you know that's right. I don't have one of those, you know, where I roll it around and Smell that's all kind of lost on me. I'm kind of like, well, this tastes good, or this is like. So this is Buffalo Trace that I poured, and we're going to do a Unity shot before harvest because it's coming up. What do you think, David? Week, two weeks? What do you think? I think a w- maybe two weeks, yeah. yeah. Two weeks away, and it this is what's going to kick it off. How much do you want to spend on drying? Not very much. Not much. Because I can come start here and get you no. all done. <laughs> no. You'd like that, wouldn't you? You always do that, though. You, you're always like, well, my stuff's, I think, I don't think I'm I don't know. Ready, Mine's, but yeah. you know, I was Honestly, I stopped and walked in yours. Yours seems drier than mine. I think we could go there. <laughs> So if we're going to start in two weeks, that means I have 13 days before I have to grease the auger <laughs> and see whether the tires hold air on the yeah. wagons or when, not. When you farm and you do maintenance shit, you never know how long yeah. it could take you to grease one fucking auger. Oh, yeah. It might take you 13 days to it grease could, it. It could. In all my case, it totally could. It's either procrastination or shit's just broker than it was yeah. supposed to be. Gosh, it was fine when we took that last one grease circuit at a time. You remember that shear pin breaking? I don't remember one that. One day, it'll be one oh. grease circuit at a time. Oh, it took. All right. Going yeah, back yeah. to the house. Are you guys fully prepared to break that bastard again? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think we I We got pretty good last year. <laughs> it didn't have, Nothing broke last year. I'm, but I'm the one that broke it. Last Wasn't year? I? I don't think we anything broke way, last year. No, it did. Clear at the end. All the way to the end, it broke. Oh, shit. All the way to the end. Getting rammy, trying to jam it in, huh? I think... Was that the night it was raining the whole damn time, and I had no clue it was raining the whole yeah. damn time? Yeah, I think it was. And I think it's one of them things that you're... I think it just... You run it... You start and stop it enough, it's just going to... It's Sooner or later, you're going to shear that bowl. Doesn't matter. You're just going to. Yeah. So, all right, just, well, let's take this shot. What do you say? All right. You got any toast? Got any toast? David, Gosh, you got I, anything? I, uh, got any, tr- you got any good I toast? I don't know. So, have I got, oh boy, got here we go. Are you getting a list? No, I just got a thing. Oh. I heard this a couple of weeks ago, and I, I noticed in your notes, you're talking about me being a mechanic or jack of all trades or something, but you know the jack of all trades thing? Yes. Mm-hmm. I, do you I know, know the full thing? Mm-hmm. I do. Yeah. I didn't, but I saw that. A, so jack, a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. That's right. That is Cheers so to that shit. So Harvest twenty twenty two. Here we come. Here we and come. let's wish it a let's wish it a good one, boys. All right. All right. Cheers to that. Cheers. Not too shabby. Like water. Good stuff. Yeah, we'll have to afterwards come back and talk about how good or bad it went. And if you can't get enough of David, he's usually always on our, our YouTube videos on This Will Do Farm showing you what the hell's going down in the combine or the planner. So if you want to check out more of David this year, yep. go over to TDF, subscribe, and you'll probably see him this harvest when we get shit done. So he, He'll he give you his wisdom on uh, why I shouldn't plant or why I should plant my fields a different direction because he barely has time to get going because the roads are so short yeah. or uh, my grain cart or my, my wagon driving or where are we? Like, where are they? Why is nobody yeah, coming? Where is Sawyer? Me? Where the we, fuck uh, is he? At? We may investigate your planting arrangement more if you want to do this. Yes. With the roads. I, I think I'd be fine like, with that. Like I was saying, you may have to get, you may get a couple horses, Sawyer, we got to cut some corners off. <laughs> <sighs> I'm starting. We're starting with one first. A drive at the end of that hundred up there. Okay. You know, putting one on the corner and yeah. planting it the other way. Yeah. And they think that th- they got to do a they got to do a study because you know they have the sight distance thing. Mm-hmm. But since it's oh. so flat there, and it's on the curve, yeah, it might yeah. have to be back a little bit. I'll just call Hora and see if I can just we can just go straight. Right take off the corner the, there. That'd probably work for him. <laughs> Get yourself a uh, 
Oh, easement? Is yeah. That what they're called? Absolutely. Well, we don't need no stinking easement. You think we should wrap it up here, boys? Yeah, Any we final should. thoughts? So, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, we did a good job of promoting the the bourbon reviews. So next week there'll be a bourbon review. I don't know what we're gonna pick. We'll grab a bottle of something. And uh, two weeks, Claire Dunn is gonna be on. So check her out on Instagram if you don't know who she is, or look her uh, up on Apple Music or Spotify. Yep, she's got music on there. So we're she's gonna talk about her story, and then she's gonna play for us a little bit. Yeah. So, so two weeks, that's coming. You guys pay the fee if you got any value. Share, share it out, pay the ticket to admission to watch or listen to the show, and thanks, David, for coming on, and we'll see you in two weeks. You bet. Thank you, guys. Appreciate being here.